Republicans defend two seats to hold the United States Senate. The COVID vaccine rollout continues to hit speed bumps. And Kamala Harris plagiarizes from Martin Luther King Jr. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Don't like big tech and the government spying on you? Well, visit expressvpn.com slash Ben to protect yourself. Well, before we get started, just want to quick remind you, quickly remind you, that you're spending too much on your cell phone bill, like way too much on your cell phone bill. You could be saving over $800 a year simply by switching to Pure Talk USA from Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. What would you do with 800 bucks? Well, probably you wouldn't send it to your cell phone provider. Instead, what you would do is spend it on things that you like. Well, here's the thing. You can have the exact same coverage as one of those big providers with a lot less cost simply by switching over to Pure Talk USA. They've got the same coverage, the same bars as one of the big carriers. They charge you half. You definitely don't have to sacrifice customer service either. Their team is based right here in the United States. They're some of the nicest people you will ever talk to. Get unlimited talk, text, and two gigs of data for just 20 bucks a month. If you go over on data usage, they're not going to charge you for it. See, here's the thing. A lot of these big providers, they will say that you need to pay all that money so that you have unlimited data, but you're not going to use unlimited data. You're probably only going to use two gigs of data. And then with Pure Talk, even if you go over, they're not charging you extra. So what exactly do you have to lose? Grab your mobile phone, dial pound 250, say Ben Shapiro. When you do, you'll save 50% off your first month. Dial pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro. Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. Again, dial pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro. And when you do, you save 50% off your first month of Pure Talk USA coverage. Okay, so let's jump in today with a story that, that should make you happy. It should make you happy because it just demonstrates once and for all that if you are looking for principle in the same place where you find politicians, you are looking in, in the wrong place. Indy, they're digging in the wrong place. So Kamala Harris, and she's being touted as the next great thing. She's so great, Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris was so great that she ran in the Democratic primaries and dropped out before her home state of California had even voted. That was after being the early front runner for the nomination based on calling the guy she would eventually be the running mate to a racist. And don't you remember all this? I know, it's been like a year and this, this, this year has been 20 years. But when that race started, Kamala Harris was considered a front runner because she fulfilled two things that the Democrats desperately wanted. She was a woman and she was black. Sure, she was unqualified. Sure, she wasn't very good on stage. Sure, she was incredibly rehearsed and had this weird cackle that she would break into for no reason at all. Somebody would say something weird or uncomfortable or she would simply be asked a tough question and she would just break into this Joker-like cackle, this insane, this insane, bizarre laughter that nobody could really understand. She was so off-putting that after she called Joe Biden a racist on the stage, she couldn't back it up. Right then, she suggested Joe Biden might have to drop out of the race because of sexual harassment concerns. And then she was like, you know what? I'm going to forget all that, and I'm just going to become that guy's VP. So Kamala Harris is not the most principled of people. I mean, I think it is fair to say that Kamala Harris and principle have probably never met. In fact, they probably have not been within a 300-mile radius of one another, Kamala Harris and principle. But because she's a Democrat and because she's a self-identified woman, this means she gets cover stories in places like Elle magazine because this is the way our disgusting media works. See, here's the thing. More people probably engage with the sort of checkout counter supermarket tabloidy magazines, the in-touch magazines and the in-style magazines and the L magazines than they do overall with, you know, kind of normal political publications. And so it actually makes a difference when these sorts of publications feature on their covers, people like Kamala Harris. But of course, I never remember them doing anything like that with Sarah Palin in 2008 when she was running for vice president with John McCain. She didn't get that same sort of coverage. Okay, so Kamala Harris is now being recast. So as soon as Joe Biden picked her, she went from being this loser who is incapable of getting her campaign together, who is extremely off-putting, very awkward. Nobody really liked her. She went from that to what a godsend Kamala Harris is. I mean, just unbelievable. The intellect, the brains, the charm, the beauty, all in one incredible package. Literally four months before, the media were like, yeah, they, they wrote her off for dead. They were like, okay, yeah, she, she was really bad at this. Then Biden picked her, and suddenly she had been elevated to godly position. It was like Moses anointing Joshua, his successor. It was incredible. It was just this incredible scene, the light shined down from heaven, and Kamala Harris became awesome again. She became incredible again. She was a heroine for the ages. And then she did precisely zero serious, hard-hitting press conferences between the time she was nominated VP and the time the election took place. Well, now... We can sort of see why this was. I mean, you know, before, right? She's bad at this. But now you can totally see why this was because this is my favorite story of the day. It's so good. So Elle magazine features Kamala Harris in their culture section. And this is what your friends in the media do. And they are not interested in putting Kamala Harris in their politics section. She's in their culture section, you see, because culture is always upstream of politics. And they have this long puff piece about Kamala Harris. Here's how this puff piece starts because it's wonderful. Here's how this puff piece starts. Ready? Here we go. Senator Kamala Harris started her life's work young. She laughs from her gut the way you would with family. 
Okay, have you ever heard Kamala Harris laugh? Um, mm. She laughs from her gut, the way you would with family, if you were then going to, you know, bomb Gotham City. As she remembers being wheeled through an Oakland, California civil rights march in a stroller with no straps with her parents and her uncle. At some point, she fell from the stroller. Few safety regulations existed for children's equipment back then. And the adults, caught up in the rapture of protest, just kept on marching. By the time they noticed little Kamala was gone and doubled back, she was understandably upset. My mother tells the story about how I'm fussing, Harris says, and she's like, baby, what do you want? What do you need? And I just looked at her and I said, freedom. This is what Kamala Harris says. Okay, so first of all, to start a story that way is the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my entire life. Okay, if, if, if your story, your political story begins when you were a toddler who fell out of a stroller, even if that story happened to be true, which it's not, as we will get to in just one moment, that is a weird, weird take. When I, this is like one of those Twitter takes where people are like, my seven-year-old daughter came in the room and she asked me, mommy, why is the gender wage gap so wide when we've taken so many steps to alleviate the gender wage gap through federal legislation? And I looked at her and I cried. It's one of those Twitter stories. Okay, where I fell out of the stroller and then my mommy looked at me and she said, what do you need? I said, freedom. By the way, in the story, it is spelled F-W-E-E-D-O-M. Freedom. Now, there is uh, one problem with this story, aside from the fact that it is really, really ridiculous. It also happens to be lifted directly from Martin Luther King Jr. So it turns out that plagiarism apparently runs throughout, like if you get within a certain distance from Joe Biden, the plagiarism is contagious. It's like COVID except plagiarism. You start sort of plagiarizing things. And this is Elizabeth Warren type stuff. She's just taking other people's personal stories and making them her own, right? But that's, that's okay, right? It's her truth. Here is a, an interview from a 1965 Playboy with Martin Luther King by Alex Haley, right? The guy who, is, who, who wrote Roots. Hey, you ready for this? Here it is. I will never forget a moment in Birmingham when a white policeman accosted a little Negro girl, seven or eight years old, who was walking in a demonstration with her mother. What do you want? The policeman asked her gruffly. And the little girl looked him straight in the eye and answered, feed him. She couldn't even pronounce it, but she knew. It was beautiful. So Kamala Harris, maybe it's the same girl. Maybe it was Kamala Harris. That little girl was me, says Kamala Harris. Maybe it was Kamala Harris. Or maybe politicians are the worst sort of skunks and they lie to you continually and they are ridiculous. And when the media act credulous with regard to Democrats, but absolutely critical with regard to Republicans, they undercut themselves. When the media print interviews like the one that Elle did with Kamala Harris, but by the way, I'm sure Kamala Harris has told that story a million times. I'm sure that she trotted it out over and people today were saying, well, did she think she was going to get away with it? Well, yeah. Why wouldn't she? Seriously, why wouldn't she? It took until now for anybody to fact check her story. If you're a Democrat, the most beautiful thing about being a Democrat is that Elizabeth Warren can lie for three decades about being Native American. <laughs> and it's only when Republicans are like, oh, yeah, by the way, she's uh, not Native American, that that becomes a real story for her. Remember, Republicans brought that up in her original Senate race in Massachusetts. And the media were like, you can't say that about Elizabeth Warren. She has high cheekbones. So if you're a Democrat, of course, the incentive is for you to make up the most dramatic possible stories in which you're a four-year-old and you're telling cops that you need freedom. Absolutely insane and ridiculous. But I think it puts us in mind of, of where we stand in politics. And again, don't seek higher values in your politicians. You're not going to find them there. By the way, check out Matt Walsh's show today. Uh, he's going to give his take on that story. He'll also be discussing white musicians who decline Grammy nominations because they're white and also Busy Phillips is this actress, I guess, and she uh, posted about her non-binary 12-year-old child. Weird how many members of the Hollywood community who are very, very warm toward a particular ideology have children who then fit particularly squarely within this ideology. Strange, strange. Okay, so uh, that is your Kamala Harris starter for the morning. That's just the appetizer, gang. <laughs> Pretty solid stuff. Okay, the big story of the day, obviously, is this runoff in Georgia. There are two separate Republican seats that are up in Georgia. Right now, the Senate is split 50 to 48 in favor of Republicans. If Democrats were to win both of those seats, it would be split 50-50. And Kamala Harris, a little girl who knew freedom, would be then the person who decides all the votes in the Senate. So that means that these races are extraordinarily important, extraordinarily important. And it means that regardless of what you happen to think about what happened in Georgia, whether you're on the Trump bandwagon suggesting that Georgia, the votes were falsified and he actually won Georgia or he didn't win Georgia, all of that is purely irrelevant, irrelevant to the question of whether you want Democrats to run the United States Senate. If you are following Lynn Wood down the primrose path to hell here and you're saying, I'm going to sit home because I am mad about the election, understand the Lincoln Project, those bunch of grifters, the Lincoln Project have been pumping out Lynn Wood and his bizarre conspiracy theories to try to encourage Republicans to stay home. 
These are the same people who say that Stacey Abrams is a hero for fighting voter suppression, trying to suppress the vote by quoting Lynn Wood to the effect that Georgia is already rigged in favor of the Democrats. Do not stay home. You need to go out and you need to vote. Right now, it is, if not a toss up, very close to a toss up. This toss up. So the, the polling data, again, is, is somewhat sporadic and people are very queasy about the polling data as well. They should be after all the polling misses in the last election cycle. Remember, there are a bevy of polling misses, particularly down ballot. Right? There are a bunch of Senate races that went to Republicans, despite the fact that the polls had suggested they were going to go to Democrats. There are a bunch of congressional races that did the same. So right now, if you look at the if you look at the, the polling data, it would suggest that John Ossoff has a very slight lead on Sonny Perdue. According to 538, Ossoff is up 49 at 47 over Purdue, which is weird considering that Purdue beat Ossoff just a couple of months back. He just didn't reach the 50% threshold necessary to retain the seat outright. Uh, Purdue beat him by like 80,000 votes. So that's a big margin for Ossoff to have to make up. Meanwhile, the other polling data shows Warnock with a with a two-point lead, 2.2-point lead over Kelly Loeffler. Right now, the markets seem to be hedging on this. The markets are very uncertain where all of this is going especially considering the fact that if the Democrats were to take the Senate, they would immediately shift into high tax gear. They would move into high tax mode, high regulation mode. The market is starting to sell off uh, as of this morning, looking at the possibility of a Democratic Senate. Nate Silver says that the Democrats have to be favored in probably both races by slightly, like a little bit at this point, which means that if you're a Republican, you cannot afford to stay home. Do not stay home. The data tends to show that the early voting tends toward the Democrats, it trends toward Democrats, and then day of, it trends toward Republicans. There's been a lot, a lot of early voting. Now, there's a theory out there put forward by Eric Erickson, who's a radio host down in Georgia. And Eric suggests that a lot of the early voting is actually Republican because Republicans have learned that not early voting is a really bad idea. So a lot of Republicans are early voting as well. If that happened, then that would be a hidden vote for Republicans that has not yet been identified because, again, all the modeling is based on the old models where Democrats voted early and Republicans voted day of. According to the New York Times, Three million people have already voted in the runoff races. Nearly 40% of all registered voters in the state. That total surpasses the 2.1 million ballots cast in the state's last Senate runoff election. That happened in 2008. The early voting data suggests the races are very competitive. Some indications Democrats had a bigger share of the early voting electorate than they did in the general election, raising hopes for a party that has traditionally been the underdog in runoff races. The general supposition was that Republicans were going to have the advantage here because Trump had driven out Democratic turnout. He had, like a lot of Democrats showed up just to vote against Trump in places like Georgia. And with Trump not on the ballot, a lot of Democrats would simply not vote this time around, while Republicans would be focused laser like on preventing the Democrats from taking the Senate. That has not happened. One of the reasons that has not happened is probably because President Trump continues to make Georgia the livest issue. And right? he's not focused on Pennsylvania anymore. He's not focused on Arizona, which is weird because obviously, even if Trump wanted to retain the presidency, he would have had to show that he actually won Arizona, Georgia and Pennsylvania. Shifting the vote in, in Georgia doesn't change a damn thing. He would actually have to win all three of those in order for him to retain the presidency. And it's a moot point anyway, because all of these states have already certified their votes. But what that has done is it has made Trump front and center in the Georgia Senate races. And it has also driven down Republican enthusiasm for the race because many of those people are angry at the Republican Party of Georgia for apparently not shifting their perception of the votes or certifying the votes or whatever. So what exactly should we expect? Well, in November, Sonny, uh, David Perdue received 49.7% of the vote, just short of the majority. He beat Ossoff by 88,000 votes. On the other side, Warnock had 32.9% of the vote. Kelly Loeffler had 25.9% of the vote. But the difference is that uh, Warnock and Loeffler also had Doug Collins in the race. It's uh, unclear exactly when we are going to know the result. Some of the rules were tweaked to encourage a faster count. The new Congress was already sworn in on Sunday. According to the New York Times, Counties were required to begin scanning and processing ballots at least a week before the election, but they can't begin counting or tabulating them until the polls close on Tuesday. The new rules might lead to quicker results, although in a close race, most Georgians may go to sleep before the news outlets have enough results to declare a winner. So we could be well into tomorrow before we actually know who won these particular Senate seats. And it is very, very important who wins these Senate seats. So Eric Erickson, again, I mentioned him because he is sort of closest to the action there. He believes that David Perdue is, uh, is in good shape against John Ossoff. He says that, that Ossoff has been tying himself to Raphael Warnock because Warnock is outperforming, particularly with black voters. Ossoff does not have the same appeal with black voters that, that Warnock apparently does. And so Ossoff has been tying himself to Warnock's leg and attempting to push Warnock over the finish line and in return, hoping that Warnock helps black voters vote for him. According to Erickson, he says, quote, Ossoff can't save himself. Maybe he can help Warnock. 
That Ossoff is having to play attack dog in his tag team with Warnock also reinforces the idea that Warnock's unfavorable rating has skyrocketed. It really does appear that Purdue has enough black and Hispanic voters voting for him over farming and agricultural issues that Ossoff probably cannot pull it off. The real race and focus is now on Warnock and Leffler. The races are both tight. If you follow the money and the attacks around the state and notice what the black farming community in South Georgia is doing, the Republicans probably keep the Senate. So that makes me feel at least a little bit better. In just a second, we're going to go through all the reasons why, actually, of the two Democrats, the one who certainly should not be in the Senate is Raphael Warnock. Raphael Warnock is a radical Marxist. Raphael Warnock is a disaster area of a human being. There is no way that the schmuck should be in the Senate of the United States. And I say that advisedly because the Senate is filled with schmucks. This guy would be one of the one of the uh, more egregious schmucks in the Senate of the United States. I, I don't want to hear any more about radicalism inside the Republican Party when you guys are all rooting on the Democratic Party for Raphael Warnock, a man who has endorsed Louis Farrakhan, Jeremiah Wright, and Fidel Castro. Hey, spare me. Spare me the crocodile tears for just a moment if you're going to continue along those lines. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, if getting life insurance is on your to-do list for 2021, Policy Genius can help you cross it off with ease. And it should be on your to-do list because if you are a responsible human being, you want to make sure that your family is taken care of in case, God forbid, something should happen to you. Well, Policy Genius makes the magic happen for you. They make it easy for you to compare more than 30 top insurers at once and save over 50% in the process. There's no hassle because their licensed experts work for you, not for the insurance companies. Here's how it works. First, you head on over to policygenius.com. In minutes, you can work out how much coverage you need and compare quotes from top insurers to find your best price. Policy Genius will then compare policies starting at as little as $1 a day. You might even be eligible to skip that in-person medical exam. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and the red tape. If you hit any speed bumps during the application process, they'll take care of everything for you. Soup to nuts. Make this the year you finally cross life insurance off the to-do list. Get protection for your loved ones. It is super important stuff. Go to policygenius.com. Dot com right now. Get started. You could say 50% or more by comparing quotes. Start the new year with one less thing to worry about. There are a lot of things in life to, to, to procrastinate about. Life insurance is not one of them because if you procrastinate and you are wrong, it is then too late. Officially, it is too late for you to get life insurance once you have failed. Policy genius. When it comes to insurance, it is nice. Very important to get it right. Say 50% or more by comparing quotes over at Policy Genius today. Okay, so Raphael Warnock is a disaster. And I think it's worth playing some of Raphael Warnock's greatest hits here because as a reminder, I don't care what you feel about the presidential election. I don't care what you feel about President Trump or about the Senate challenge. I don't care what you feel about the Electoral College when it comes to this Senate race. These, and by the way, you know who else doesn't care? Trump, right? Trump was down there last night in Georgia rallying for Leffler and Purdue, saying it's important for the Republicans to retain the Senate. It is particularly important to keep Raphael Warnock out of the Senate. Raphael Warnock, John Ossoff is just like a normal democratic socialist. Right? He's just, he's your normal everyday trust fund Democrat socialist who has bad views and is extraordinarily disingenuous. Raphael Warnock is a deeply radical figure, an extraordinarily radical figure. And basically, John Ossoff is, is just sort of a, a Pete Buttigieg type. And he's somebody who, who mimics Barack Obama's patterns of speech and who is fluent in lies and says socialistic things. But that's about it. Raphael Warnock, truly down to his bones, believes horrible things about the United States. So just a few of Raphael Warnock's greatest hits for the media that didn't cover them because the media have decided that Raphael Warnock is actually a godsend. The New York Times printed a piece over the weekend talking about how Raphael Warnock loves to speak uncomfortable truths. But what if he likes to speak uncomfortable lies? What if he says horrible things on a regular basis? So for example, what would you think of a candidate who praised Louis Farrakhan's a nation of Islam as important? Well, here is uh, Raphael Warnock doing just that a couple of years, about, uh, a couple of years ago. The nation of Islam is significant uh, but its numbers don't come anywhere near the membership of uh, our churches. Um, its, its voice has been important, and its voice has been important even for the development of black theology, because it was the black Muslims who, who challenged black preachers. That is the person who they want to elevate to the United States Senate. What if, what if you had this guy saying on tape, that Fidel Castro's Cuba is very much like the United States of America. Oh, wait, we do. We pray for the people of Cuba in this moment. We remember Fidel Castro, whose legacy is complex. Don't let anybody tell you a simple story. Life usually isn't very simple. His legacy is complex. Kind of like America's legacy is complex. It's true. Fidel Castro's legacy is complex. Like, you know, jailing tens of thousands of dissidents, 
creating a living situation so bad that people literally attempt to float cars from the 1950s from Cuba to the coast of Florida. But it's a complex legacy, says Raphael Warnock. That guy is the person that the Democrats desperately want in the Senate. Okay, well, what, what if, for example, this person had suggested that America worships whiteness? This person running for the United States Senate in a majority white state, because Georgia is a majority white state, like every other state in America so far, as I'm aware, except for, I think, California, which is now plurality minority. Raphael Warnock saying that the state in which he lives, right, worships white, like white people are worshipped in the United States, says, says Raphael Warnock. Interesting take from a person the Democrats desperately want in the Senate. And if it is true that a man who has dominated the news and poisoned the discussion for months needs to repent, then it is doubly true that a nation that can produce such a man and make his vitriol go viral needs to repent. No matter what happens next month, more than a third of the nation that would go along with this is reason to be afraid. America needs to repent for its worship of whiteness. What a, what a, what a sweet on, fellow. On full I mean, why shouldn't that guy sit in the United States Senate? What if we had, you know, this guy on tape suggesting, for example, that you can't both be in the military and serve God? Well, what if you had that guy on tape in a state like Georgia, which is a heavy military state? Should that guy be in the United States Senate? Democrats say you need him in the Senate, Raphael Warnock. Again, this is like the easiest. The Apple research on Warnock is the easiest thing in the world. You just look at what he said. And yet Democrats are down there campaigning for him. The media are covering for him in real time. The media, honestly, like figuratively, the, the media establishment needs to be burned to the ground. Figuratively, for those at Media Matters. And the media establishment is awful, 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 awful. If the Republicans had said anything remotely equivalent to this on the other side, it would be the headline for days on end. Every Democrat would be asked if they agree with this. Every single one. I'm old enough to remember when a congressional candidate named Todd Akin said something weird about rape and abortion, something bizarre and strange about rape and abortion in the Missouri race uh, several election cycles ago. Every single Republican in America was asked about it. Raphael Warnock says things like Fidel Castro is a complex person and Nation of Islam is great. He also, by the way, says that Israel is routinely committing human rights violations and is and is horrible and evil. And the Palestinians are, are just the, the sad victims of all of this. He says that America is uh, is a racist place. And he says that nobody can serve God in the military. And not a single Democrat has been asked about Raphael Warnock's comments. Not one. That is the easiest litmus test in the world for how biased and disgusting our media are. So here is Raphael Warnock saying that you can't serve both God and the military, which is a hot take if ever I've heard one. America, nobody can serve God and the military. You can't serve God and money. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. America, choose ye this day whom you will serve. And everybody's cheering. Oh, how wonderful. What a, what a wonderful guy. What a wonderful, wonderful guy. We'll get to more of the greatest hits of Raphael Warnock in just one second. A lot of stuff that you're not going to hear unless you actually pay attention to alternative media because the regular media are just the mouthpiece for the Democratic Party. That's all they are. They, they are just a Media Matters Democratic Party mashup. That's all they do now. It's pretty incredible. We'll get to more of it in a second. First, let's talk about one area of your life where you might be vulnerable to people stealing your assets that you might not have thought about. So you think about many things that you own that are worth a lot of money. And the thing you own, undoubtedly, that is worth the most money is your house. And nobody can steal your house, right? I mean, nobody's going to like back up a truck and then just drag your house away. But what they can do is they can access your home title. I got a crash course into home title theft, and uh, it is not good. Here's how the crime happens. The legal titles to our homes are kept online. They can be hacked. A cyber thief finds your home's title, forges your signature on a quit claim deed, stating you sold your home to him. Then he takes out loans against your home until all of the equity is gone. You're not going to know until the collection calls pour in. You are not protected by insurance or your bank or common identity theft programs. Home title lock protects you. In the unlikely event you become a victim of title theft while a member, home title lock will spend up to a quarter million bucks in legal fees to help restore your home title. It's your most prized asset. You shouldn't let people access the value inherent in it. Go to HomeTitleLock.com, register your address to see if you are already a victim, then use code RADIO for 30 free days of protection. That is code RADIO at HomeTitleLock.com. Again, that's HomeTitleLock.com. Okay, a few more greatest hits from Raphael Warnock, since apparently the media don't care about any of these. Well, what if uh, Raphael Warnock were on tape saying that racism is America's pre-existing condition? Oh, wait, he is. We've got a lot of problems, but I would not be a prophet if I did not tell you that racism is America's pre-existing condition. In this land where we warehouse 25% of the world's prisoners, although we're only 5% of the world, we ought to ask ourselves, what has it cost us not to cover it? All right. All right. Not to face up to it, not to confront it, not 
to deal with it. Racism is America's pre-existing condition. Okay, this guy is considered the stronger candidate in Georgia. Between Ossoff and Warnock, this guy is considered the front runner among the Democrats in Georgia. Like, he's the stronger horse in Georgia. Why? Because the entire Democratic liberal establishment has bought into the ridiculous critical race theory suggestion that America is inherently racist, its institutions are inherently racist, and that only the people who speak truth to power like Raphael Warnock have the legitimacy to say this kind of bullcrap routinely. I mean, the, man, the man's on tape preaching Marxism and preaching that America is a racist nation. And then what does he do? He goes into the mainstream outlets and he says, my story could only happen in America. This, this sort of two-facedness when it comes to politics is, again, common but gross. Here is Raphael Warnock openly preaching Marxism. Again, all this is on tape. Where are the media for all this? They don't care. They don't care. They, he, this guy ought to be in the Senate, of course. I love this Pope. He said, well, I'm not a Marxist, but I know a few Marxists and they're pretty good people. So hard to discover and to hear an authentic vision and voice of authentic spirituality that gives voice to the least of these. And when it shows up, people describe it as some strange ideology rather than the vision of that poor Palestinian prophet who said that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Okay, there's so many things wrong with that. Number one, Jesus was not a socialist. Number two, Jesus was not a Palestinian because Palestinians did not exist. The Palestine did not exist. It was Judea, idiot. He's, a, he's an anti-Semite. He's a racist. And he also happens to be like uh, a pretty wild character in his own right. Okay, I mean, b b by the way, when, when you're talking about your know, fealty to biblical text and fealty to the Bible, you might not want to say that abortion is consistent with your Christian views. That's it. But, but that is what he says. I mean, th that's what all good Christians say, so far as I'm aware, is that killing the unborn in your womb is totally something Jesus was up for. I believe that health care is a human right. And I believe that it is something that the richest nation in the world provides for its citizens. And for me, reproductive justice is consistent with my commitment to that. Uh, I believe unequivocally in a woman's right to choose and that the decision uh, is something that we, we don't want government engaged in. I've been focused on women's health, women's choice, and reproductive justice. Uh, that is consistent with my view of, uh, as a Christian minister. Oh, well, you know, if it's consistent with his view, I mean, not consistent with, with the Bible, but if it's consistent with his view, then, of course, we should take it very seriously. As far as him on a personal level, it now turns out, according to Jim Garrity over at National Review, that Raphael Warnock has had some trouble paying his taxes and fees in Fulton County, Georgia. Four times in six years, Warnock, as CEO of Ebenezer Baptist Church, had tax liens imposed against him for failing to pay for trash collection and recycling. The Fulton County Tax Commissioner collects fees for trash collection and recycling on behalf of the city of Atlanta. For those wondering if the church would be considered exempt, uh, no, the church is not considered exempt. So he, he makes about $250,000 a year, by the way, leading that congregation, but he couldn't pay the trash fees. He's a delight. Also, uh, caught on tape, an altercation between him and his wife and the police in which his ex-wife uh, accused him of running over her foot with a car and then talked about how innately dishonest he was. This got zero broad coverage in the mainstream media. Right? Fox covered it. We covered it a little bit here. Wasn't covered at all by the New York Times or, or CNN, so far as I'm aware, or if it was, it was in very, very minimal fashion. Imagine if a Republican's ex-wife had come out and made allegations about this sort of thing. Well, probably that would put Barack Obama in the Senate in, 2000, in 2006, probably something like that with Jack Ryan and Jerry Ryan. In any case, here is uh, Raphael Warnock and his ex-wife caught on tape. All right, so you walked over. So I'm like, move, so and she won't move, and she's keeping the door open. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Chloe, just stay in the car. And I move and I close it my car door, get in the car, and I start to move slightly, mm -hmm. thinking she's here. Clear. She yeah, I'm thinking she's clear. And I barely move. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, she's screaming that I ran over her foot. I don't believe it. I've tried to keep the way that he acts under wraps for a long time, and today he crossed the line. <laughs> so that is what is going on here, and he's a great actor. He is phenomenal at putting on a really good show. Now, believe all women, unless they happen to be making allegations about uh, Raphael Warnock, in which case, don't believe the woman, ignore the story, and pretend that Raphael Warnock is a good guy. Other indicators that perhaps Raphael Warnock is not such a wonderful person. Uh, not only did he uh, praise Fidel Castro in 1995, right? He, he was a youth pastor of a church that hosted Castro, and people chanted Fidel, Fidel's name in that congregation. Not only that, he has also praised Jeremiah Wright. Right? He, suggests, he says Jeremiah Wright is a truth teller. Right, Jeremiah Wright, that you know, the GD America guy, the guy who said that the chickens came home to roost on 9-11. Well, Raphael Warnock says you ought to go back and see if you can find and read as I have the entire sermon. It was a very fine sermon. 
Jeremiah Wright was right when he said the attack on him was in a real sense an attack on the black church. The message of Jeremiah Wright was that public policy has consequences. He also called Wright's sermon a, quote, very fine homily in his 2013 book. And he compared Jeremiah Wright to Jeremiah. Okay, this person is who the, the Democrats believe must be in the United States Senate. By the way, also the same guy who uh, was charged at one point for uh, obstructing an investigation into child abuse. The charges were later dropped. At a summer camp, there were allegations of child abuse. Apparently, he tried to get between the police and p- people they were questioning. He's a delight. But Democrats are down there saying Raphael Warnock ought to be the front runner for the Senate. But again, he is the one who is most, of the two Democrats, he's the one who is more likely to end up in the United States Senate, which says something about the, dis- the disgraceful state of our politics. I mean, that guy shouldn't be within sniffing distance of the United States Senate. Meanwhile, in the other race, you have John Ossoff running against David Perdue. And Ossoff is not running against David Perdue. Ossoff is running against Kelly Loeffler. Right, he is trying to boost Warnock, and he's trying to attack Leffler because his goal here is to be the attack dog on behalf of Warnock, hoping that Warnock's black support will then translate over into support for John Ossoff. So he's going out there and he's just saying overtly false things about Kelly Leffler. So over the weekend, he was asked specifically about the fact that he has covered up, for example, his own involvement with Chinese firms, like he's received money from Chinese firms that he refused to report on. And now, and his response was, Kelly Leffler is campaigning with a Klansman, which is an overt lie. Of course, she's not campaigning with a Klansman. She takes thousands of pictures. One of the pictures included a person who happened to be a member of the Klan. She immediately denounced that as soon as she found out who was in the picture with her. And Asaf says that he acts like she gets a, a grand wizard up there introducing her at every rally. So he's just a damned liar. It's just, this is one of the more disgusting lies I've heard in, in recent memory. Here is, uh, here is John Asaf being disgusting. Here's the bottom line. Kelly Leffler has been campaigning with a Klansman. Kelly Leffler has been campaigning with a Klansman. And so she is stooping to these vicious personal attacks to distract from the fact that she's been campaigning with a former member of the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, we deserve better than that here in Georgia. I mean, no, what we deserve better than is is people like John Ossoff, who has spent his benighted, ridiculous trust fund career basically living off of his family's largesse and then trying to facilitate his entry into politics several times over and losing every time. He lost to Karen Handel, then he lost to Purdue, and now he's going to lose again to Purdue, we can hope, today. By the way, this is the same John Ossoff, who uh, apparently, according to the Washington Free Beacon, declined a request from the Washington Post to, quote, release further financial information relating to his company, noting that the particulars of our annual finances are confidential, even after a number of controversial payments to Ossoff's foreign film company surfaced in September, including one from a Chinese-backed media giant. The refusal came months after Ossoff quietly disclosed receiving at least 5000 bucks from PCCW, a Hong Kong-based media corporation owned in part by the Chinese Communist Party. But his redirect is that Kelly Loeffler is uh, Kelly Loeffler is a racist, of course. Ossoff is the kind of delight, by the way, who uh, also says that Trump supporters should never show their face in public again. So remember that, Georgian Republicans, if you're from Georgia and you're not voting today, remember, the person who could get elected to that Senate seat believes you should never be able to show your face in public again for the rest of your life. Here he is, John Ossoff, schmuck. We need to send a message this year. We need to send a message that if you indulge this kind of politics, you're not just going to get beaten. You're going to get beaten so bad you can never run or show your face again in public. Because we have had enough, absolutely enough, of what we are getting from Donald Trump and his fellow travelers right now. Okay, so um, that sounds great. You, you want that guy in the Senate? If not, why don't you go vote? Go vote today. Go vote. If you've not voted yet, go vote today. Republicans must hold the Senate. This isn't even talking. about. This is talking about who the people are that you're talking about elevating to the Senate. This isn't even talking about the national implications of this vote. Again, Kamala Harris running the United States Senate with Joe Biden in the presidency and Nancy Pelosi in the House is a disaster area beyond disaster areas. Get ready for full-on nationalized health care. Really, because the, the so-called public option is, as everyone everyone knows, just a gateway to full-on nationalized health care. That is the goal. And get ready for massive tax hikes and tax increases. Get ready for extraordinary violations of your religious freedom. Get ready for public schools to continue to, crack, to, to cram down critical race theory. Get ready for private schools to meet crackdowns from the federal government. Get ready for churches to be attacked as bastions of regressivism. Get ready. Okay, it comes down to those two Senate races today in Georgia. The battle is on, and if you're sitting home, there is no excuse for it on any moral or political level, none. We're going to get to more of this in just one second, and we'll get to why it is that so many Georgia uh, Georgia citizens seem suspicious of some of the uh, procedures in the state of Georgia when it comes to voting. It, it is amazing to me that Stacey Abrams, who's been championed as 
you know, this, this light and joy when it comes to Georgia voting after claiming for years without any evidence that Georgia was engaged in voter suppression. I'm going to give you an example of uh, why people might be suspicious of the fact that Democrats wish constantly to push forward with procedures that completely undercut voter credibility and voter, voter veracity. I'll get to that in one second. First, let's talk about how you need to improve your business. You constantly need to improve your business. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 top job sites with one click. Then ZipRecruiter's matching technology scans thousands of resumes and profiles to send you the most qualified people for your job. If you're really interested in a candidate, you can even invite them to apply for your job with one click. ZipRecruiter sends them an email from you. You stand out from the competition. We use ZipRecruiter here at The Daily Wire all the time. We are a fast growing company. That means we are constantly recruiting new people to the company. And we are constantly replacing bad old employees with better employees. They shall remain nameless. In any case, ZipRecruiter, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. Just head on over to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. You want to make sure, especially in this competitive economic time, that you are getting the best employees. If you are a potential employee, you want to make sure that you are getting the best job listings. ZipRecruiter makes all of that happen. And again, right now, try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Okay, we're going to get back to Everything happening in Georgia in just one second. Then we're going to get to the, the continued fallout from election 2020 and the, and the situation in the Senate. And we're going to get also to an extraordinary piece in the New York Times. Extraordinary. Just doing Chinese propaganda. Well, we are back to the days of Walter Durante. The New York Times is just doing open Chinese propaganda at this point. We'll get to that in a second. First, there's a reason millions of people believe lies about conservatives. That is because you are constantly surrounded by an incredible miasmatic cultural wave. It, it, it's, it's just in the air. It surrounds you. And it's, it's a tsunami, right? It's also, it is both air and water. It's, it's a tsunami that overwhelms you of, com- of commentary and content and entertainment and culture that says that conservatives are bad people. Every narrative is driven to this extent. Okay, when, when people say that politics is downstream from culture, this is what they mean. That when we have political discussions about specific races or about specific issues, all of that is downstream from generalized feelings that people have with regard to people across the political aisle from them. So when you have an entire culture pushing the idea that every conservative is John Lithgow from Footloose, that is a really, really problematic thing. It is a really, really bad thing. Now, I always say facts don't care about your feelings. The problem is that feelings very often don't care about your facts. Culture shapes feelings. And this is why conservatives cannot surrender the culture to the left. We have. We've surrendered Hollywood to the left. We've surrendered sports to the left. We've surrendered so many areas of American life to the left. So Daily Wire, this year, we are fighting back. We are fighting back. We're doing something that's risky for us as a company. But it is necessary, and we need your help. Daily Wire is jumping into the culture. We're doing that with our first motion picture, Run, Hide, Fight. Now, this is not a stereotypical conservative movie where it's just, you know, some sort of altar call for conservatism. In fact, it's not particularly political because the goal here is to drive people to reconsider their stereotypes about conservatives by providing them entertaining content that is not designed to preach at them. Okay, so this movie is designed particularly for young people. It is intense. It is violent. It is definitely rated R. It does have a powerful message to go with it. The movie follows a high school besieged by a quartet of school shooters. One young girl, 17-year-old Zoe Hall, uses her wits and survival skills to fight back. It stars some actors you will know, people like Thomas Jane. It's really, really good. You can watch the full trailer on the Daily Wire YouTube channel right now. You're going to want to see it. It's great. Not only is it great, it's really important because we need to push into the space. Conservatives spend their lives whining about Hollywood. You need to create a competitor. You need to help out competitors. You need to make sure that somebody is competing with the Netflixes and the Amazons of the world to ensure that people can actually see entertainment that doesn't spit on them every day of the week. Run, Hide, Fight is the name of the film. It will be available to watch Friday, January 15th, my birthday, over at dailywire.com. We'll be doing a special live stream premiere the night before, Thursday, January 14th, on the Daily Wire YouTube channel. Let's kick off 2020 by fighting back in the actual culture wars, creating our own content. The culture wars have to be fought. That's what we're doing here at Daily Wire. Go check us out. Dailywire.com slash subscribe. You're listening to the largest and fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. Okay, so meanwhile in Georgia, obviously a lot of people in Georgia are very concerned about voter procedures in in, in the state. One of the reasons that people are very concerned is because you have judges like Stacey Abrams' sister who literally attempted to allow people who should not be eligible to vote to vote. Right there, Politico reported December 28th, a federal judge in Georgia ordered two counties to reverse a decision, removing more than 4,000 voters from the rolls ahead of the January 5th runoff elections that would decide control of the United States Senate. The judge is Leslie Abrams Gardner, the sister of Stacey Abrams. 
She concluded that the counties appear to have improperly relied on unverified change of address data to invalidate registration in the two counties. So basically what happened is that there were some people, they went through the voter registration data. They found that there were literally thousands of people who had changed their addresses. The board of canvassing took a look at this. They found that this was probably correct and they wanted to invalidate the ability of those people to vote. Okay, and then the plaintiff said, okay, we don't want this judge ruling on this case because it turns out not only is she Stacey Abrams' sister, but that Stacey Abrams is involved in very, very similar litigation. And the lawyers in that litigation are also the lawyers in this particular litigation, even though Stacey Abrams isn't directly involved in this litigation. Right? Didn't matter. Stacey Abrams' sister did not recuse herself. She simply ruled on it. And she said, okay, well, you know what? We're going to, we're just, we're just going to allow people to essentially register at false addresses. I mean, that, that's, that's essentially the outcome of the case. And she said, you know what? There's no reason for me to recuse. So no big deal. No big deal. Is it any wonder that people are somewhat suspicious here? Somewhat suspicious? But the media have, have suggested that any Republican who is suspicious of any voting protocol, it's just because they're, they're gullible and they're full of it and they're crazy. Here's the thing. I have suggested over and over and over that allegations, especially outsized allegations, require outsized evidence. I've been perfectly consistent on this across every single issue of which I am aware. Whether you're alleging that America is systemically racist, whether you're alleging that America is systemically sexist, whether you are arguing that America's police are targeting black Americans, whether you are arguing that, that Donald Trump is a Russian asset, I have always said, whether you're arguing about allegations against Brett Kavanaugh, I've always said that evidence is the final adjudicator as to whether a matter is true or not. This seems fairly obvious. Right. But you know who has not held this standard like at all? Democrats and members of the media who have maintained that all of the proposals that I just put forward as lacking evidence are true without providing any of the evidence. And so uh, spare me the hysterics from people like Don Lemon at CNN. He says, I just we, we can't we don't have to respect Trump supporters who believe this crap about voter fraud. Why? You at CNN believe Stacey Abrams crap about voter suppression in a race she lost by 50,000 votes. So why, why exactly? Who are you to be sneering? In other words. And here is Don Lemon on CNN doing the sneering, because, again, these are your objective news media. And so stop saying that we must respect Trump supporters who believe bullshit because it is bullshit that you have been feeding them. The president and you have been feeding them the BS. And now that they believe it, all of a sudden, you again, another self-fulfilling prophecy and feedback loop. Now, with that said, I do think that it is worthwhile noting here that the many of the allegations that have been specifically made in Georgia have been, in fact, thoroughly debunked. doesn't mean every allegation has been thoroughly debunked. It does mean that some of the more egregious allegations, Dominion voting, for example, or tens of thousands of dead people voting, that sort of stuff, that's, it's, it's not true. Gabriel Sterling, who is the elections official in Georgia, did a very long press conference yesterday in which, which he went through these allegations in detail. And if you care about facts, you should actually listen to what Gabriel Sterling has to say. I understand that it may debunk some ideas that people have about election verification in Georgia, I understand that a lot of people want to believe what, what President Trump has said about this sort of stuff. But the bottom line is that, that President Trump is not particularly detail-oriented. I don't think that he, he really cares very much about the specific allegations. He has the general tenor of the allegations, which is what he repeats. That's the way that Trump does business. In some cases, that's great. In some cases, it really is not. Here was Gabriel Sterling. He was the Georgia Voting System Implementation Manager uh, talking about some of these specific allegations. There is no shredding of ballots going on. That's not real. It's not happening. No one is changing parts or pieces out of Dominion voting machines. That is, that's, that's not a real, I don't even know what that means. It's not a real thing. Um, that's not happening. The president mentioned on the call yesterday or, or from two days ago. That's, again, not real. I don't even know how, how exactly to explain that. We have claim after claim after claim with zero proof. Zero. Okay, so... The, here's the reality of the situation. And you know who knows this? Everybody, including Josh Howley, including Ted Cruz, inc including everybody on the Republican side of the aisle. All the Senate election challenge stuff that is slated for tomorrow, it's going to go nowhere. Everybody knows this. All of this. OK, there, there is no shot that Donald Trump ends up as president on January 21st based on these procedures. I, I, I don't like saying uncomfortable things, but that is uh, that is just a simple fact of the matter. OK, you know who knows that? Josh Howley. You know how we know he knows that? Because last night, Brett Baer asked him specifically about it. And Josh Howley had no answer to it. And Brett Baer said, are you are you saying that Donald Trump is going to be president on January 21st or has any shot at being president on January 21st? And Howley himself said, the reason that I'm challenging these votes is not because I think that, that it's going to change the outcome of the election. I'm doing it because I care about voter fraud and voter integrity. OK, I also care about voter fraud and voter integrity, which is why we should redo the laws in a lot of these states. Universal mail in balloting is a disaster area. It should be redone. All of these laws need to be clarified in states like Pennsylvania. OK, there needs to be immediate vote counting as the counts come in in the pre-vote in places like Florida so that you can have, right? Florida did this and it was great, 
right? Georgia did not. And so you end up with these, these days long counts. Right? All that stuff should be changed. We should have voter ID, right? All this stuff is perfectly obvious. You don't challenge electoral college votes based on that. So Brett Baer asked Halley, like, is this designed to change the outcome of the election? Because it's not going to. And Halley basically acknowledged it's not going to change the outcome of the election. You've seen various Senate Republicans say they won't support, they either won't object to any states or, or they won't support uh, any challenge, any debate to any of these electors. Uh, so their votes are their votes and, and people have to reach their own conclusions. But I think it is absolutely imperative. When you look at something that happened or like what happened in Pennsylvania, for example, where you had a state that didn't even follow its own constitution and its own laws. You've got uh, allegations of irregularities in that state and many others. It is vital that we be heard on this issue and we have a chance to debate it. And that's why I'm going to object. Okay, so even he is saying right there, yeah, it's, it's about debating voter fraud. It's, 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 not about, it's, it, it's not about changing the outcome of the election. Howley knows that. So don't believe anybody in the media or anywhere else who's telling you that this is a litmus test about fighting voter fraud or voter irregularity. It's not gonna change a damn thing in terms of the outcome. If you actually want to change the voter fraud and voter irregularity procedures, you have to do that within the states. Nor do you want the federal government, especially a federal government run by Democrats, being the final adjudicator of what constitutes a free and fair election. If you don't like democratic standards for elections, don't hand over democratic elections to the federal government. That is like the worst solution that you could have with regard to, to some of this stuff. Okay, meanwhile, the vaccine rollout continues to be incredibly slow across America. And naturally, the media are blaming Republicans, which makes it no sense since Republicans are the only ones who are actually attempting to tranche out this vaccine as fast as humanly possible. Meanwhile, you have Andrew Cuomo, who has simultaneously said that he's going to find people a million dollars for for not doing the prioritization system properly in tranching out the vaccines. In other words, if somebody hands out a vaccine to the wrong person, he'll find you a million dollars. Also, if you waste a dose, he will find you a million dollars. Okay, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Andrew, Andrew Cuomo is an awful, awful governor. But who are the media focused in on? They're focused laser-like on the governor who's actually done the best in terms of having a challenging situation with millions and millions of seniors living in his state. And that would, of course, be Ron DeSantis. Florida's death per million rate is 19th in America, 19th. Okay, but by media coverage, you would think that Ron DeSantis is the worst governor in America. He is not. So yesterday, Ron DeSantis rightly got very pissed off at a reporter because the reporter, uh, the reporter decided she was just going to basically ask him why he was a bad person. And he filled her in on why she doesn't know anything about the vaccine distribution process. We've seen websites crash and also senior citizens waiting overnight for the vaccine. Where was that at? We've seen it in Duval, Broward, Orange and Lee County. And why was like in Lee? Why did that happen? Did you investigate that's, why? That's my question to you, Governor. You're the governor of the state. I'm not the governor of the state. OK, but you didn't investigate why that happened like in Lee County. Why, why was there a big line? Did you did you investigate why? Could you tell us why? Because we, we distributed vaccine to hospitals and, and the hospital said, first come, first serve. If you show up, we'll do it. So they didn't use a registration system. There wasn't anything that was done. And there's a lot of demand for it. So people are going to want to so go ahead and, uh, no and get it. So there was no plan then from the state to make sure that senior citizens didn't wait outside overnight? So the state is not dictating to hospitals how, we're not dictating to Carlos Magoya how he runs his operations here. That would be a total disaster. These guys are much more competent to be able to deliver healthcare services than a state government could ever be. Okay, the reality is it should not be hard to tranche out the vaccines. You, you have to get them to as many sites as humanly possible and then just stick everybody and do it, in, do it in order of age. If you show an ID and it shows that you are above the age of 70, you go first. If you are above the age of 65, you go second. If you are above the age of 60, you go third. Right? This is very not hard. It's really not hard. Not only that, it turns out we have an extraordinary amount of vaccine that is sitting and being wasted on the shelves because these things have expiration dates. And they also exist in the freezers. Once you take them out of the freezers, particularly the Pfizer vaccine, it goes bad after a certain amount of time, which is why in, in California, apparently, there was a situation where somebody removed too much vaccine from the freezer and there weren't enough people there. So they literally just went around and started sticking people. People were like, that's great. Why, haven't, why aren't we doing that everywhere? Good question. Good question. When DeSantis says the reason people are showing up for the vaccine is because it is only being made available in certain counties by certain areas and people are showing up and they will wait over uh, overnight in line to do it. M by the way, my parents would do that, right? My parents are just under the 65 age limit. Okay, if the vaccine were made available to them, 100% they would camp out overnight to get the vaccine so they could see their other grandchildren. Right? 100% they would do that. And there are ways to get the vaccine out there faster that we are not taking advantage of. One, stop holding back the second doses of vaccine, you idiots. Hey, there is the first dose of vaccine. It provides a significant amount of immunity. And there's the second dose. You don't hold that in a freezer for a month. 
You trench out all the vaccines right now. Second, there is open talk now about the fact that one half a dose of the vaccine is exactly the same in its immune response. This is what Dr. Slowey over at Operation Warp Speed says as an entire dose of the vaccine. So you cut it all those doses in half. You have now quadrupled the amount of vaccine in circulation. And you do this by age. It is not hard. It is unbelievable that we have not trenched out more vaccine at this point. It's, just, it's simply incredible that we have not done that at this point. So guys, get on your horses. If you would like the vaccine to be tranched out so we can all get back to something resembling normal life, then stop with all the FDA, CDC garbage and get the vaccine out the door as fast as possible to the oldest people possible and then move on down the chain. All righty, we'll be back here later today with an additional hour of content. Otherwise, we will see you here later. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Production manager, Pavel Wydowski. Our associate producers are Rebecca Doyle and Savannah Dominguez. The show is edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Fabiola Cristina. Production assistant, Jessica Kranz. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright 2020. You know, the Matt Wall Show, it's not just another show about, about politics. I think there are enough of those already out there. We talk about culture because culture drives politics and it drives everything else. So my main focuses are life, family, faith. Those are fundamental. And that's what this show is about. I hope you'll give it a listen. Listen. 